is central now. So what are the truths of Sankhya? Remember one thing. The Sankhya philosophy is very correct and acceptable at the spiritual levels of consciousness, but it is not valid at the supramental level. Okay. It, you go beyond the concepts. As I said, at each level, there are rules and regulations and uh, truths which are applicable only to that level. Okay, So when you go to the spiritual planes of consciousness, Sankhya is absolutely valid. But when you go to the highest levels, you go to the supermental level, third level three, it's not applicable anymore. Because in, we'll read that now, Purusha and Prakriti, consciousness and force, are totally separated from each other in the lowest plane at our level because consciousness and uh, our body are almost opposites. Huh? Matter and spirit are not the same. But when you go to the spiritual levels of consciousness, you are conscious of both, but they seem to be unconnected. Okay, So that's why the, as the third level in the super mind, they are very much connected. Not even connected, they are one. You can't even distinguish between them. That's what Sri says. Consciousness automatically is force and force is automatically consciousness. Okay. It's not that they are two together like two friends and joined and working together. No, it's not like that. They are one. They are not even two. So that's why Sankhya is not valid at the third level. Okay. I'm now reading the and we'll have a brief discussion on the what is the Sankhya philosophy. What are the truths of Sankhya? The philosophy drew its name from its analytical process. The analytical process. Sankhya is the analysis, its enumeration, numbering. Okay, With numbers, it is supposed to be 24 basic principles. Okay, That's why it's called Sankhya. Sankhya, the number. Okay. The separative and discriminative setting forth of the principles of our being, obviously the ordinary mind sees only combinations and results of combinations. We don't see body, mind, life separately. So how do we know that it is there separate? When you go to level two, the spiritual planes of consciousness, you see that they are quite different. They are different worlds. There is a difference of, there is a world of matter, there is a world of uh, life, which is prana, and there is a world of mind, mental plane. They are all totally different, but they merge one into the other. Okay, They merge one into the other. So at our level, ordinary mind, we only see the combinations. When you see a man, you are seeing the combination of all the three, a body, a vital, and a mind, and results of combinations. Okay? It did not seek at all to synthesize. The synthesis comes at the highest level. It does, did not seek to. It was very satisfied with the spiritual planes of consciousness. Its original standpoint is in fact dualistic. In fact, it says that the ultimate truth is twofold. There is a consciousness and there is a force which are quite different. They are together and they work together and complement each other, but they are different. It's like, as I said, two friends. But in the Advaita philosophy, they are not two friends. They are only one. Okay. So, dualistic. This is a dualistic philosophy. The ultimate reality is not one, but two. Consciousness and force in the Sankhya philosophy. In the Advaita philosophy, they are only one. Its original standpoint is in fact dualistic. Not with the very relative dualism of the Vedantic schools, which call themselves by that name Dvaita. Okay. The Dvaita philosophy refers only to the, it's a different interpretation. The interpretation in the uh, Vedantic school okay, is uh, Madhvacharya, for instance, okay, and also Nimbarkar. These are the philosophers who say that the individual soul can have a relation with the divine. A relation of devotion, a relation of love, okay, but they cannot become one. The Advaita philosophy says it can become one. So there are three grades of the uh, uh, Advaita philosophy. So the Advaita philosophy says very clearly 
that no, they are two different things. Consciousness is different and force is different. <coughs> That's the Sankhya philosophy. So the, the word Dvaita is slightly different in Sankhya and in the Vedanta philosophy. In the Sankhya philosophy, dual, dual means Purusha and Prakriti are separate. Okay? Purusha and Prakriti. But in the Vedantic philosophy, Dvaita means the individual soul is different from the supreme soul. The question of Prakriti does not even come in there. Okay? Because the Advaita philosophy, Vedantic philosophy says even Prakriti is only <laughs> the individual soul which is plunged into darkness. Okay, so that's it. <clears throat> so its original standpoint is in fact dualistic, not with the very relative dualism of the Vedantic schools, which call themselves by that name Dvaita. Okay, I told you that there is uh, Madhvacharya and uh, Nimparkar. Now these are the two, but in a very absolute and trenchant fashion. In the Sankhya philosophy, totally different. One is a blind man and one is a lame man. The lame man can't move, but he can see. He has wisdom. He has got eyes. That's a Purusha. And the blind man cannot see. He is, cannot see, cannot have knowledge, but he can move. That's Prakriti. Okay? So how does the world come into existence in the Sankhya philosophy? The Lame man sits on the shoulders of the blind man. Okay. So the lame man is sitting on the shoulders of the blind man. The blind man has got legs. And the man with the eyes is telling him, go here, go there and directing him. So consciousness and force when they come together, they can move and create and go places. So that's a Sankhya philosophy. Okay. For it explains existence not by one, but by two original principles. Not the word original. They are the last, um, the fundamental principles of existence. There is nothing beyond them. Purusha and Prakriti. Whose interaction is the cause of the universe. When Purusha and Prakriti interact, there is creation. But when they don't interact and remain separate, there is no creation. That becomes a silent mind. Okay? Purusha is a soul, not in the ordinary or popular sense of the word, but a pure conscious being, immobile, immutable, self-luminous. So you start with the idea of Purusha, who is at the second level, and it can also go to the third level. And when it comes down into the, uh, the lowest level, the Purusha becomes also subject to Prakriti. Okay? So that's the, as I said just now, the childhood, adolescent and old age is like that. Completely seems to be different, but same thing. So Purusha, the inactive, Prakriti, the active. Prakriti, the active, is the blind man but with legs. Okay? No, no consciousness, no knowledge because he's blind. Mechanical and Purusha is the consciousness which has got eyes, but it does not move, lame, inactive. So the two together only can become effective. This is Hanke philosophy. Purusha is the soul, not in the ordinary or popular sense of the word, but a pure conscious being, immobile, immutable, self luminous. This is the Brahman consciousness and the self. Or the, you can call it also the Atman. It's a Nirvana experience of the, uh, the Buddhist. Same thing. So, and self-luminous. Self-luminous, huh? no. Self-luminous, it doesn't need light from outside. It generates its own light to see what is there. Okay? That's the, uh, that's a, we have to understand self-luminous in that way. You don't need to throw light on anything. You generate the light yourself and see what has to be seen. Prakriti is energy and its process. Whatever are the results of the energy and its process. 
Now, note interestingly one thing: wherever you see movement, you are seeing the results of movement, the results of prana. You are not seeing prana itself. Okay, you don't see electricity flowing in a in the wire, but the electricity you can use. Your fan moves. Your um, ironing box becomes hot. You see the results. Okay, that's what Sri is also making uh, making clear here. Okay? Purusha does nothing, but it reflects the action of energy and its processes. Prakriti is mechanical, but by being reflected in Purusha, it assumes the appearance of consciousness in its activities, and thus there are created those phenomena of creation, conservation, dissolution, birth and life and death, consciousness and unconsciousness, sense knowledge. intellectual knowledge and ignorance action and inaction happiness and suffering with the purusha under the influence of prakriti there you are pallu you are asking under the influence of prakriti attributes to itself it's an illusion although they belong not at all to itself but to the action or movement of prakriti alone so the purusha which is p cap okay But at the lower level, <laughs> it doesn't become peak cap anymore. It becomes very, very unconscious, and it is a sleeping purusha. He has to wake up. That's the soul in man is sleeping. It's not divine yet. It's got the potentiality of divine, but it's, it's not the divine yet. When it wakes up and starts evolving, goes on through many lives, then it becomes awake and conscious. But that takes many lives. Okay, so all this, what he said, is a duality in the physical world. The duality belongs to the prakriti level at the lowest level. Okay, prakriti at the lowest level is unconscious and mechanical. This is the scientific level. Okay, you have to uh, think a lot about it. Then also there is another thing. You have to slightly give another impression, another image to explain what he is saying. He is saying that at our level, the you think that you are acting, na? You think that I am eating, I am talking, I am now studying, I am answering a phone, I am doing it. You feel, but who is that I? It is actually prakriti which is doing, but you identify yourself with prakriti and say that you are. You are doing. You are not doing. Your soul is the soul is a you, but it is identified with your body mind life, and therefore it thinks that it is doing. So when you separate yourself and go into the Brahman consciousness, this is what you realize that you are not the doer. It's one of the big experiences of in yoga. One of the starting experiences of yoga is you are not the doer. The ego disappears, and you realize that you are static. You are fully conscious. But static, you are not no power. You are looking at the lower end, and the universal prakriti is actually moving you about like a puppet. This is what you realize. Okay. So, how to explain this? Again, I gave you the idea of the cinema. Okay? The soul is a cinema screen. It is white. In other words, it is featureless. Even white is a feature. Think of something which is not even white, okay? And vast and infinite. And on that screen are being thrown the images. What are the images? The events and sounds and sights and tastes of the physical world. Okay? These are the images which are being thrown on the screen of the purusha. And purusha is thinking that I am the images. Okay, but when the projector is turned off, the mind becomes silent. The images disappear, or they seem to be different. Now you find that you are only the screen. You are the. You are absolutely. You are the infinite, immutable, featureless self. This is the. <coughs> Uh, there is a lot of uh, internet up and down, huh? Some are joining and some are getting cut off. 
we can't help it. <clears throat> so, it's very clear now. You have to slightly give another example to yourself, like the cinema uh, screen and the uh, screen and the images on the screen. They are two different things. Okay. So, you have to think a lot about it and see how you can understand this. There are so many ways of seeing. One is very clear. Your soul is sleeping at this level and it is identifying itself with the body and life. Okay. And you think that you are doing. Actually, it's the ego which misleads you. And when you go above, your consciousness rises out of the body and life, then you realize that you are not the doer and the ego disappears. And you realize that your body and life are only instruments. It is a house in which you are living. It's not you. You are the house owner. But you thought that you are the house. That's the thing. Okay? So, can we go to the next one? The next para. Some of these uh, concepts you have to spend a good deal of time okay, and go on thinking about them. Then it becomes real. Otherwise, they remain abstract notions. That's the reason why I give images. But sometimes the images help. Sometimes the images can also confuse. <laughs> okay. But keep in mind always Purusha and Prakriti and then see how the images um, are relevant to the concept of Purusha and Prakriti. Okay. So let's read the next one. For Prakriti is constituted of three gunas. Let's read that. Who can read? Shall I, I read? Shall I read? Yes, do that. For Prakriti For is constituted of three gunas or essential modes of energy. Hmm. Sattva, the seed of intelligence, conserves the workings of energy. Rajas, the seed of force and action, creates the workings of energy. Tamas, the seed of inertia and non-intelligence, the denial of sattva and rajas, dissolves what they create and conserve. When these three powers of the energy of prakriti are in a state of equilibrium, all is in rest. There is no movement, action or creation, and there is therefore nothing to be reflected in the immutable luminous being of the conscious soul. But when the equilibrium is disturbed, then the three gunas fall into a state of inequality in which they strive with and act upon each other and the whole inextricable business of ceaseless creation, conservation and dissolution begins, unrolling the phenomena of the cosmos. This continues so long as the Purusha consents to reflect the disturbance which obscures his eternal nature and attributes to it the nature of Prakriti. But when he withdraws his consent, the gunas fall into equilibrium and the soul returns to its eternal, unchanging immobility. It is delivered from phenomena. This reflection and this giving or withdrawal of consent seem to be the only powers of Purusha. He is the witness of nature by virtue of reflection and the giver of sanction, Sakshi, Anumanta of the Gita, but not actively the Ishwara. Even his giving of consent is passive and his withdrawing of consent is only another passivity. All action, subjective or objective, is foreign to the soul. It has neither an active will nor an active intelligence. It cannot therefore be the sole cause of the cosmos and the affirmation of a second cause becomes necessary. Not soul alone by its nature of conscious knowledge, will and delight is the cause of universe. But soul and nature are the dual cause, a passive consciousness and an active energy. So the Sankhya explains the existence of the cosmos. Now, note very carefully that last sentence. So the Sankhya explains the existence of the cosmos. So it is not Srivindra philosophy at all, nor the Advaita. It is Sankhya which is explained in this way. And it is valid at the middle level. Okay, it is valid. So we go back to the beginning of the show. For Prakriti is constituted of three gunas. 
they are called qualities and in english use the word modes okay because quality uh, has got usually a very positive thing no uh, his his uh, sincerity is a very good quality quality can hardly be bad okay so you don't use the word quality but you use the word mode okay so that's why otherwise you can say also if you use the word quality as a characteristic it's valid but if you use the word quality as something good in your view then it is not valid that's why essential modes and what are the three modes one is sattva then rajas and tamas and there is explanation for all these things okay sattva is the seed of intelligence seed why because sattva at the mental level is already sattvic but it is semi intelligence it's not full intelligence the full intelligence comes in the spiritual planes of consciousness and even more in the super mind but not at the lower level that's why it is seed of intelligence conserves the workings of energy okay. in the sattva it conserves the workings of energy it does not move about too much it is very very calm and quiet that's what i mean by conserving the energy those who are very excitable are belong to the rajasic plane but those who are very calm even in the midst of battle and midst of difficulties okay they are very calm and quiet that's why conserve the workings of energy <laughs> is not that the energy is missing the energy is there but very much controlled okay very interesting words he is using then we come to rajas which is the power movement okay energy the seed of force and action creates the workings of energy there again note very carefully you see the workings of energy you don't see the energy itself when can you see the energy when you go to the spiritual planes of consciousness you see the energy but nobody can see the electricity in the wire okay but uh, i'm going to make a slight uh, uh, a, a diversion because this is how but is energy flowing in the wire or not yes it is and what happens is that when you are in a higher consciousness you can see the subtle energies okay let me tell you a very interesting story okay it's not a story it's a fact uh, you know tall bob na all of you know tall bob <laughs> yes ah yes okay so all these things these biological functionings are all physical okay biological functionings are all physical even when you have fear even when you are happy there is a biological function that takes place there are these uh, endocrine glands that secrete things into your blood and it changes your mood okay so exactly in the same way when you can artificially change these things by taking drugs okay in yoga you change them by a yogic practice and they become permanent but sometimes with drugs you can change them temporarily so this is but that's very dangerous because it can take you anywhere in the yogic process you can control these but with drugs you cannot control it will take you here and there that's why it is so dangerous so what happened to bob was very interesting i'm telling you because he is quite frank about it he used to take drugs at one time but fortunately for him it was not habit forming and he had very interesting experiences okay one of the experiences was that he is seeing subtle things he is seeing that electricity is flowing in a wire and he told me he could see blood flowing in the veins <laughs> when you are at the second level you are seeing the subtle realities okay you are not using your physical eyes and your physical ears you are not seeing them but you are using your subtle sights so this is what we call the uh, what is it? esp extra sensory perception okay so this this experience he had so he was very lucky that he didn't have bad experiences but i have heard many many uh, experiences of people who have had 
quite bad experiences. <laughs> okay. There's one girl, I won't tell the name. Uh, she's not an ashramite, okay. And she had an experience once she wanted to try LSD. Okay. LSD. It's a mind bending, they used to call them mind bending drugs. They change your consciousness. So she took that and she knew that you can have uh, untoward consequences. So she got someone to look after her. So there was, and she took that inside in a chair. In a short while, what happened to her was that she found that she is getting up. Actually, she was not getting up, but she's seeing herself getting up and walking towards the wall. And when she came to the wall, she started climbing up the wall. Okay. And when the ceiling came, she started walking on the ceiling upside down. And then again, the vertical wall, she came down and she came. Up. So you, it changes your perception of things altogether. Okay. So sometimes you can have very bad experiences and sometimes you can have, if you're lucky, good experiences. Okay. Yeah, tell me. <laughs> Isn't it a hallucination? It is not hallucination. It is what normally people who don't understand the subtle senses, they call it hallucination. But it's not hallucination. They are realities in the subtle world. They are realities. <laughs> because your subtle body can move in that way. It is not subject to gravitation. No? <laughs> uh, yeah, it can happen. Okay, I'm just mentioning that because the, we don't see Sattva Rajas Tamas. I came to that because Rajas, we don't see the origin. We don't see the prana. But can you see it? Yes. When you go to the spiritual levels of consciousness and use your subtle senses, you can see the prana. You can see the electricity. But you, normally we see only the combinations and the results of energy. Okay, same thing with the word. Workings of energy. That's why I went in to explain to you what is the workings of energy and what is the energy itself. Okay. I go into all these details because you see how comprehensive is Ramdo's language. Okay. Everything you have to understand in the right way. Now we come to tamas. Tamas, the seed of inertia and non-intelligence. Tamas is the darkness in the mind lethargy in the body and an unwillingness to act and non-understanding in the mind, ignorance and stupidity. Okay. Now, but is that necessary also? Why did the divine create tamas? Because tamas is non-action. Now, suppose we stopped, creation stopped at the level of rajas. What will happen in the physical, in the physical world? Everything will be moving all the time. So you need stability and you need non-change. You need permanence of form. And that's the function of tamas. It is so necessary. But, so it's a necessary thing that is created. But when you want to progress, that's a resistance that you get. <laughs> okay. So this is the thing. Okay. So this is the sattva rajas tamas. Okay. So. Tamas, the seed of inertia and non-intelligence, the denial of sattva and rajas dissolves what they create and conserve. Okay? So there is dissolution, there is creation, and there is conservation. Now, note if you go to the highest level, I'm going to give you another idea which may seem a little strange to you, but you think about it, you will see that it is true. Okay? There are aspects. You must not misinterpret. Creation is Brahma. He is created. And so that's what she is saying. Uh, dissolution, creation and conservation. Okay. So dissolution is Tamas. And creation is Sattva. Uh, sorry, Rajas. And Sattva is the maintenance, conservation. So they correspond to the three gods. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Brahma is creating, Shiva is destroying, and Vishnu is conserving. And, and conservation is possible? Yes. Because if creation and destruction 
occur one after the other, then you will see them separately. You will see a creation, and after one second or two seconds, you see the destruction. You will see both together, so one by one in sequence. But if they are happening together, Vishnu comes into the picture. You will not see the creation and the destruction. But this is the truth of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, and they correspond to this Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Okay, Rajas is creating, Tamas is destroying, and Sattva is preserving. Okay, I have gone into a little detail and given you several aspects of it. You have to think about it and then try and make it absolutely concrete to yourself. Okay, and they correspond at the highest level to absolute fundamental realities: Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And all these are there in the physical world at the individual level also. Okay, your body corresponds to tamas, your vital energy corresponds to rajas, and your mind corresponds to sattva. Okay, there is a very interesting letter of Sridharu where he is, someone sees Sridharu in a certain uh, way. Okay, and he says, "Oh, I dare say you saw my Shiva aspect." So. Shivaji also has all the three aspects, okay, and he saw the Shiva aspect, <laughs> and Shiva is a very complicated god. He is representative of so many things, but one of the things is this, okay. He is also he is a destroyer. The dance, na, Shiva's dance of destruction, okay. So when you hear these things all together, sometimes it can be a little confusing. But the more you think about it, you will see that destruction is not something necessarily bad. Okay, we interpret it as something bad, but it's not. It is the clearing of the past so that the future can be built again. That is the justification for tamas and destruction. So, <clears throat> when these three, I am now continuing with the para we read just now. When these three powers of the energy of Prakriti are in a state of equilibrium, all is in rest. There is no movement. In the consciousness, there is no movement. And what is that? That is Brahman consciousness. That is Nirvana. That is the self, the Atman. Okay. There is no movement at all. And for you, the world doesn't exist in a real way. You see it as something unreal. That's the thing. So when sattva and tamas are absolutely equal to each other, there is no movement. All is in rest. There is no movement. Action or creation, and there is therefore nothing to be reflected in the immutable luminous being of the conscious soul. But when the equilibrium is disturbed, then the three gunas fall into a state of inequality. In which they strive with and act upon each other, and the whole inextricable business of ceaseless creation, conservation, and dissolution begins. Again, note the three things: creation belongs to sattva. No, sorry, creation belongs to rajas. Conservation belongs to sattva, and dissolution belongs to tamas. Now, dissolution belongs to tamas. Also, is very clear. In the physical world, if something doesn't move, it slowly will be destroyed. Yeah? Suppose a a cat is just lying calm, quiet, without anything, it will dissolve one day. It will die. Okay. Even a stone, which is there, not moving, the wind and the rain and the heat and the sun, all these things will completely destroy it one day. It may take a million years, but it will destroy. It. Okay. So. This is the how it is acting. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas are acting from the highest level to the lowest level. They are all there present, working together. Uh, Ramakrishna explains that in a very interesting way. He says the sea is when it is absolutely calm and quiet, it is the self, is the soul, is the Atman, the Brahman. And when the waves start forming, there is creation. And what are the waves? The forms in the physical world. Then, so it can be the same sea is either silent or it is moving. If it is moving, it's a physical world. If it is not moving, 
is the second level of the spiritual planes of consciousness. You are in the nirvana consciousness. Okay, so this is what he said. So, but when the equilibrium is disturbed, then the three gunas fall into a state of inequality, in which they strive with and act upon each other. We can see that at our level, we have a thought, and the thought is sometimes contradicted by the vital, and sometimes supported by the body or contradicted by the vital. At our level, mind, vital, and body are very rarely in harmony. They are always conflicting with each other. Okay. So that's the inequilibrium of the body-mind life. Okay. So <clears throat> what is available and what is true at the universal level is also true at the individual level. And this works in this. So when the equilibrium is disturbed, then the three gunas fall into a state of inequality in which they strive with and act upon each other. The mind and the vital are struggling with each other and the body also puts in its own word and there is always a disharmony between them. Other and the uh, in which they strive and act upon each other and the whole inextricable business of ceaseless creation. Note the word inextricable. You can't distinguish between the three. Sattva Rajasta must become all mixed together and it produces ceaseless creation, conservation and dissolution. Again, he is using the three words, creation, conservation and dissolution. Unrolling the phenomena of the cosmos. This continues so long as the Purusha consents to reflect the disturbances which occur, which obscures the eternal nature and attributes it the nature of Prakriti. In other words, your soul is identified with your body mind life at an individual level and the universe is also going on. There is the force of inertia, there is the force of energy and there is also an intelligence which is brooding everywhere. Okay? So, at the universal level, Satvaraja Samas is active and applicable and in the individual also it is applicable. So you remain in ignorance so long as you identify yourself with your body-mind life. But when he withdraws his consent, the gunas fall into equilibrium and the soul returns to its eternal unchanging immobility. There is the experience of the self. It is delivered from phenomena. This is the mukti, deliverance, salvation if you want, mukti. Okay. So, this reflection and this giving or withdrawal of consent seem to be the only powers of Purusha. Purusha does not have any power, but only it can say yes and it can say no. And even this yes and so are very, very passive. That's what Sandhya is saying. He is a witness of nature by virtue of reflection and the giver of the sanction, Sakshi and Anumanta. Sakshi is the one witness. No movement at all. Anumanta, yes, I agree. Yes, no, I don't agree. That's all. Okay? But not actively the Ishwar. When you become the Ishwar at third level, then you have the power. But not in the second level, nor anything in the first level. No power. Even his giving of consent is passive and his withdrawing of consent is only another passivity. So, I'll finish the paragraph. All action, subjective or objective. So, subjective action, emotions and thoughts. Objective actions, the body actions in the physical world. is foreign to the soul. It has neither an active will nor an active intelligence. It cannot therefore be the sole cause of the cosmos and the affirmation of a second cause becomes necessary. Not soul alone by its nature of conscious knowledge, will and delight is a cause of the universe, but soul and nature are the dual cause, a passive consciousness and an active energy. So the Sankhya explains the existence of the cosmos, which is valid at the Level 1 and level 2, but not valid at level 3. This is Ankit Telegram. Okay, we have gone beyond our time and we will stop here today. So, next time. Uh, and
Vallu, I will send you that Sankhya philosophy chart. Okay. Yes, Rangada, merci. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll send it to I'll send it to her, Rangada. Okay. By WhatsApp. Thank you so I'll much. Yes, dear. Okay. Yes, dear. Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, other, other thing also, I've messaged you, you just see it. No? Okay, okay, sure, sure. Another. Au revoir. 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 Au revoir.